Hello everyone, I hope you are doing well. So in today's video, we are pretty much going to go through the 2024 VCE sample physics paper that just came out yesterday. And so like always guys, before I start this video, if you guys want private tutoring in specialist methods, physics or chemistry, you can always email me through this email. So basically, we're going to be going through questions 1 to 8 for today. Um, and yeah guys, if you guys see any mistakes, please let me know. Again, these are my suggested solutions. There is no actual solutions to this paper. So if you guys want to basically, let's say, you know, do this paper and want to check the answers, please have a look at mine and compare them. Um, if you see any misconceptions I've made or a little mistake, please let me know. I will try to fix it. And yeah, let's smash through this paper. Question one, Shanna has a tricycle with a attached trailer that she can use to give her little brother a ride as shown in figure one. Shannon and her tricycle have a combined mass of 45 kilograms, and her brother and the trailer have a combined mass of 25 kilograms. The situa this situation can be modeled by representing Shannon and her brother as blocks A and B, respectively. Okay. So, training Shannon's effort as an external force of 35 newtons and ignoring all retarding friction, this model is shown in figure 2. Alright, perfect. A. Calculate the magnitude of the acceleration of Shanna, her brother, and the tricycle with the trailer. Ignore the mass of the rod that connects the trailer to the bike. Perfect. So, because Shanna is basically putting all the effort, she is accelerating, and everyone in the system is going to be accelerating at the same rate because what she because they're both all attached. It's it's like an actual. It's all a combined system basically. So, basically, everyone in the system has the same acceleration. So, the acceleration is going to be the same. For all. So what we can actually do is we can actually combine, we, we can make this whole two boxes, basically, these two blocks as a full one block. So let's do that. So we can make that as a one full block. Sorry, I meant like that. All right. Where, of course, um, it's A plus B, basically. It's the birth, it's the addition of masses, which is, um, let's take a look. So 45, so basically... So 45 plus 25, I just want to double check. So we have 70 kilograms. And basically, it's Shanna basically pushing with an external force of 35 newtons, which is accelerating everyone, basically. All right. Now, if we want the acceleration, it's basically F net. So we can use um, F net equals mass times acceleration. There's only one force, and the net force is actually 35 newtons. So let's say 35 newtons. Your, to your mass, your total mass, which is 70, times your acceleration. So basically, your acceleration is going to be 35 divided by 70, basically 0 0.5. So write that as your answer. Beautiful. So everyone's basically accelerating at 0 0.5 meters per second squared. Next question. Calculate the magnitude of the force exerted on Shanna and and the tricycle by the brother and the trailer. Aha. Uh -huh. So basically, we're going to have tension. I mean, it's not a rope. It's like a metal thing. But we're going to consider it as tension. So if you look over here, there's going to be like a tension force. There's going to be two tension force and they're both equal. Basically, they're equal values. Now, the main thing that we want to try to calculate was calculate the magnitude of the force exerted on Shanna and the tricycle by her brother. So on Shanna by her brother, which is this one, this uh, tension force. Uh, basically, these two tension forces are the same. So you can actually isolate this system of A or the system of B. But I'm going to basically just isolate the system of B. So I'm going to basically draw a triangle of just B itself, which is you know, 25 kilograms, where it only has a force of tension. So F net equals mass. I, mean, I should kind of draw, uh, write those all of my working out here. Is it two marks? Oh, it's only one mark, so... Yeah, so basically it's F net equals mass times acceleration. And so your F net is actually... There's only one force, which is your tension. So tension is equal to your mass, which is a, it's a 25 kilogram object, and your um, acceleration. Now, we know they are accelerating at 0.5 meters squared, so 25 times 0 0.5. Basically, two, two significant figures. That's 12.5, but 13. So it's actually 13 newtons. Is that magnitude? Yep, so it's beautiful. That looks perfect. Is that right? Yep. And these, both of these, basically, both of these actually have the same force. 
this tangent, they are actually equal. So I could have isolated this one if I wanted to, and it still give me the same answer. Mm. Question C. State the magnitude of the force exerted by Shanna and the tricycle on her brother and the trailer. So we basically want this one now. Here. Now we know that they are equal, so basically the magnitudes are going to be the same. So it's going to also be 13 newtons. Beautiful. So basically this is just application of Newton's third law here. D. In real life, Shanna finds that finds that once she ha has got the tricycle and the trailer moving, they travel at a steady speed. So basically like a constant speed. Which, of a full, which one of the assumptions made in modeling her motion needs to be changed in order to explain why Shanna does not continue to accelerate? So she has no acceleration. Of course, you move at, if you move at a constant uh, speed, you will have your acceleration will be zero. The problem with this kind of question here, if you see here, is that if your acceleration is uh, zero, it means your net force has to be zero. Now, when we basically put, uh, put this system all together, like simplified it by putting it all together, which was, you remember, 75 here. It was 75 kilograms. Oh, sorry, 70, I think. Yep. It was 70 kilograms. And this force was the external force of 35. We only saw... We can see that this is your net force is 35. It's actually not zero. So basically, for us to get acceleration to be zero, basically, uh, an assumption that has to be made to, you know, um, for her to basically go at a steady speed and to not accelerate, is basically she needs an external, to balance out this 35 Newton, she needs another frictional force. She basically needs friction. Because remember, we here, we... We were, you know, not assuming, we were ignoring basically friction, but if she wants to travel at that steady speed, she needs a frictional force of 35 newtons, basically. She needs, and do basically these will cancel out, and hence your net force will be zero, and basically she will move at a constant velocity, and hence that that's, means that, you know, her acceleration is zero, and she moves at that steady speed. And so the assumption that we just basically need is the, the effect of friction force needs to be considered in the model. So it's only one mark, yeah. So, which of the following assumptions made in modeling her motion needs to be changed in order to explain why Shanna does not continue to accelerate? Yep, she did not consider frictional force, and that needs to be considered for her to not accelerate, basically. So, what we're going to say, the effect um, of friction needs to be considered in the model. Beautiful. That's it. One mark. Yeah. So we need friction. We need the effect of friction for us to get that. Beautiful. What a nice question to start the exam with. Question two. Let's have a try at this. Lucinda is running at a speed of six meters per second along a horizontal diving platform that is eight meters vertically above the water. She runs horizontally off the end of the diving platform and lands at a horizontal distance D from the end of the diving platform. All right, <clears throat> calculate D, the horizontal distance between the end of the diving board and the point where Lucinda basically lands in the water, uh, modeling Lucinda as a point of mass. All right, so we want basically the horizontal distance. Now, we've given the horizontal velocity, we just need the time. And so to basically calculate the time, we're going to actually look at the um, you know, vertical components. So... What, are we, what do we know about the vertical component as well? We know that you, your initial velocity is zero for the vertical component. We also know that your, um, your displacement is negative eight because she goes downwards. We also know that acceleration is negative 9.8, of course. And what we basically want to calculate is the time. All right, which gives us, you remember, so what formula should we use? We use S equals ut plus half at squared, where uh, s is basically negative 8, u is basically 0, so u t, which means ut that, so half a negative 9.8 t squared. So basically, we get, all right, negative 8, times 9.8, so basically we get t squared to be 
and say square root of that, we basically get t is equal to 1.27 seconds. So basically, it takes 1.27 seconds to go from here down to here. All right, perfect. So now, using my horizontal velocity command, uh, horizontal velocity, so we know that distance is equal to vt. So hence your distance is, so your velocity is 6 in the horizontal component, and t is 1.27. So your distance is 6. We get basically to two significant figures, 7.7. .7. Beautiful. That uh, looks perfect. B. Lucinda would like to spend more time in the air before she lands in the water. So she wants more time. Uh, how much she achieved this? Justify your reasoning. No calculations are required. Hmm. All right, so she wants to have a longer time, basically. All right, there's many ways you can actually, um, well, one way she could actually do that is by basically, not just basically just running horizontally, she can actually do this. If she can, you know, run and jump at an angle, so basically just jump, it basically, we can, we basically have also, we, we don't just add a vertical component, no, we don't just add a horizontal component, we also add a vertical component to her velocity, which basically allows her to have more air time, basically, to more, you know, before she hits the water. So that is one great thing to talk about, I think. That's the, the most easiest that comes to my mind. Of course, there's uh, many ways, but I think, to be honest, yeah. Because she's just basically running horizontally. What she can do is basically run at an angle. She can jump of a platform at an angle, basically. To, yeah. Because we will add also a vertical component to her velocity, which will give her more time. Yeah. Because she jumps at an angle. Beautiful. That looks Perfect, that's a, yep, that looks like something we can talk about. And yeah, because you only need one and you need to explain. Okay, let's do what we said. So, she can basically jump off the platform at an angle. This basically adds a vertical component to her velocity allowing her speed so her uh, to spend more time in the air before Gravity brings her down to the water. Beautiful. I think that's, yeah. I mean, that's one justification. I think there's more, but I think the most easiest to come in mind is basically she not just runs horizontally, she can jump at an angle. And so that adds, um, yeah, basically gives her extra time, makes her time longer in the air. So beautiful. Uh, question three, let's have a try at this, basically. Okay. The graph in figure four shows the force versus time t for a competition tennis ball while it's being hit by a tennis racket. The ball is at rest, so its initial velocity is at rest before the collision with the tennis racket. All right. Calculate the impulse acting on the tennis ball during this collision. Show your reasoning. So, of course, we have a force time graph. And remember, the area of a force time graph gives you the impulse. So we just need to basically calculate the area. Now, this is not a uniform thing. So basically, the best way to kind of calculate the area, to estimate that area, is to basically find the area of one box. So basically, one of these boxes here. And then to estimate how many boxes there are. So let's first estimate how many boxes we can count. So we can see that there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 30, 31... Um, 32, 32, so 32, we can say 33, including that one, 33, 34, including that one, 34, oh, sorry, th sorry that was 34, yep, 34, um, 35, we can say, 36, 37, including all those, 37, 38, <clears throat> basically 
39, claim that one, uh, 39, 40, 40, basically 1, uh, so it's like 42, let's say f approximately 42.5, 43 basically, we're going to say 43, including that one too, yep, 43 boxes I count, so basically 40, 43 squares, now, of course there's a range of values you can get, like, you know, if your answer is approximately the same, you still get the full marks. Of course, it doesn't have to be exact. Of course, you're just estimating. So I estimated 43 squares, basically. So I just need to... Okay, so that's what I do. So 43 squares. So basically, the area of one square is what? So it's basically um, 50... So 50 times... 0.001, which gives me 0.001, that gives me 0 0.05, and so basically we do is multiply that by the how many squares we had, so 43 squares, that gives me 2.15, basically 2.15 newtons per second, that's it, that is perfect, that's my impulse. Question me, the competition tennis ball has a mass of this. Calculate the speed of the tennis ball in kilometers per hour. All right, so in kilometers per hour. Okay, so we know that impulse is mass. It's the change in momentum, so V minus U. Now, of course, we know U is zero because it said it started at rest. So basically, it's just MV, basically. And so we know our impulse was what? 2.15. The mass of the ball is 0, 0.0. 60 V. Which basically gives me a velocity of 35.83 meters per second. Of course, we want in kilometers per hour. And to do that, we basically just have to multiply it by 3.6. And so we get 129 kilometers per hour. Beautiful. Um, this question, so practice tennis balls are heavier than competition tennis ball. Determine what effect, if any, this will have on the speed of the practice tennis balls if the tennis racket produces the same force versus time graph as shown in figure 4. Okay. Um, of the practice ball, so shown in figure 4 in the present, explain your reasoning. All right, let's think about it. Mm. So we know that impulse, so the impulse will be the same because we're still using the same force um, time graph, so that our impulse will be the same which is mass times V minus U. Basically, U is still zero because remember, you still are basically starting initially with rest. So we basically get this. Now, we know that uh, your velocity is basically then your momentum over your mass. Basically, if you have a heavier ball where your mass increases, what's that going to do to your velocity? Your speed of your ball is going to be decreasing, basically. And so that's what we're going to basically, yeah, that's all you're going to need to do. So there's going to be a decrease and we're going to explain that now here. So, let me write a nice statement. All right. So, okay, so the speed of the ball will decrease. Basically, using the same force time graph gives the same impulse. So it gives the same impulse and so using oops using V equals one over M ah uh, sorry not P equals so as using um basically yep impulse over M as mass increases increases v decreases so velocity decreases that is you know i think that's justified you've kind of showed what formula you use and yeah beautiful next question question four let's have a look at this all right 
Uh, Jennifer and Lee are experimenting with springs using a baby bouncer of the type shown in figure 5. They hang the bouncer vertically from a doorway. The mass of the baby bouncer is 1 kilogram. Genevieve, Genevieve and Lee place a mass of 4 kilograms in the bouncer and gently lower it to the equilibrium position where the mass is stationary when released. Uh-huh. Okay. So, Genevieve and place a mass of that. Okay. And so, they gently lower it to the equilibrium position where the mass is stationary when released. The bounces spring extends by 0 0.5 meters. All right. That's how it looks. Calculate the magnitude of the change in gravitational potential energy of the mass as the bouncer is lowered. Okay, let's actually just have a draw a nice diagram to kind of represent this because I think that'll make it easier to understand. What we basically have is say this is your surface. This is your doorway basically. And so basically you have this spring and you know, it basically, imagine they, uh, they basically had put a mass of five kilos here. Five kilos basically. Because you remember you're adding your one kilo to that four, five kilo. So basically what they've done is basically, the, imagine the thing had basically nothing over it. It had nothing. So the spring itself is already one kilo. And they added an extra four into it. So basically they add a four. So there's going to be five kilos in it. So basically now it has five, let me draw it nicer to kind of. So basically now it is five. So it's basically five kilograms. And so what they do is they, the mass of the foliage is gently lowered to the equilibrium position. So basically they grab it, basically right now. Um, wait, Genevieve and Lee place, wow, this is so confusing. What's happening here? Genevieve and Lee place a mass of four kilograms in the bounce and gently lower it to the equilibrium position where the mass is stationary when released. So basically what they do is they hold it and they basically bring it down. So they compress the spring basically. By some distance. And so... What's happened now is you've got compression of uh what was it? Zero point zero five meters. Alright, so that's what they did. And the bouncer spring extends to that. Genevieve and Lee placed a mass of four kilograms. Yep. Alright. That looks good. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so basically what would have we would have done is basically they would have held this. Um, when they would have put those five kilograms, they, they would have held it and then they would have leveled it. They would have took their hand off. Okay. That looks like that. Mm. Calculate the magnitude of the change in gravitational potential energy of the mass as the bouncer is lowered. Okay, so you can see, okay, considering this is the ground, let's say we make this the ground, basically. Considering this here is the ground. Um, and that is not a nice kind of... So basically it's compressed... To here basically all right so your basic mgh so basically you were you would have um you know gpe and max gpe here but as you compress it it would have been zero so your change in your gravitational potential energy is basically so your gpe is mgh so the mass of your thing your total mass is five of course your g is 9.1 and your height that you basically decrease is by 0 0.05. Is that right? 0 0.05. Beautiful. So, 5, 9.1, 0 0.05. You basically get, um, okay, times, oh, one, one, why did I write 9.1? 9.8. Oh my God, what's wrong with me today? I'm so tired. <laughs> 9.8. So 9.8, 2.45 basically. That looks good. So 2.45. So to two significance, that's just basically 2.5 new uh, joules. All right. Let's have a next question. Calculate the elastic strain potential energy of the stretched spring in the equilibrium position. So when it's at this equilibrium position. So what do I need, know basically? I know that to calculate that, I just basically use half. But I don't know K, so I need to first calculate K, the K constant or your spring constant. But luckily, we know it's in its equilibrium position. Where If it's in equilibrium position, what do we know? Well, we know that the force of gravity 
is going to be equal to your force of spring. So they have to be equal if they're at equilibrium, so because they basically cancel out each other out. So your force of spring is going to be equal to your force of gravity. So your force of spring basically is given by uh, k times change in x. And your, uh, you know, your force of gravity is given by mg. And so k is basically mg over uh, change in x. So the mass is 5, of course. g is 9.8. And your change in x, that was basically compressed by 0 0.05. 0 0.05. Beautiful. That's going to give me my constant. 5, 9.8, 0 0.05. That gives me a k constant, basically, of uh, 980. Basically, uh, basically Newton's, you know, Newton's per meter, basically. Um... Now, I've got this, what I can do is basically use my formula. Uh, spring potential energy is half, um, you know, five, half k change in x squared, basically. So, basically, it's half your k value, which is 980. Your change in x, basically, your change in x was uh, 0 0.05 squared. So, that. Point zero five squared. Which basically gives you 1.225, which um, to two significance, that's just basically 1.2. That is it. That looks nice. Perfect. Has energy been conserved in the mass uh, spring system? Hmm. Has energy been compressed? No, it has stored. Well, let's think about it. Well, we know at the top, it was basically like held stationary, but it wasn't moving. So your kinetic energy is zero. It's only GPE, basically. It was only GPE that was um, at the top when it was at the top, basically, which was max. And, of course, spring was not compressed. It was zero also. So, overall, at the top, it was basically the, your GPE is your overall total energy. And remember, your total energy is always constant. So, that's good, which um, is 2.5, basically, joules. So your total energy, so your total energy is... 2. Point, was it 2.6? 2.5, sorry. 2.5 joules. So, as they compressed it down, now here, have a look here. We know that GP is zero, because there's no more height. We consider that as the ground. Your kinetic energy is zero, because when you're at your equilibrium position, basically, you have no velocity. So, your kinetic energy is zero. So, it's all spring potential energy has to be max. So, it means that your total energy at the bottom has to be your spring potential energy. And so they have to be equal, because remember, the total energy is constant. So this, your spring potential energy should be equal to 2.5. But they're not equal, meaning that there was energy lost. And so guess what? It means that your energy was not conserved in this, you know, mass spring system, basically. Beautiful. Let's explain that. Um, I'm going to kind of go in detail. So I'm just trying to help students out to understand. So I'm going to write a lot. To I'm going to explain what I basically just said right now. Um, so first we're going to say... Energy has not been conserved, has not been conserved. The total energy of the mass spring system is constant at the top position only gravitational so only gravitational potential energy <laughs> exists hence this is the total energy. This is the total energy measured at 2.5 joules. So, let's have a look at the bottom. So, at the bottom, so at the bottom, okay, so at the bottom position, energy should be 
uh, 2.5 joules. However, the actual the actual spring potential energy so the actual potential sh um, at the bottom was 1.2 joules basically indicating what did I write? So indicating some energy was lost. Was lost from the system. Beautiful. I mean, that kind of goes into detail for those two marks, but I hope that when you read this, you can really understand what I mean. And yeah, that makes beautifully sense. Beautiful. Question five, let's try at this. Uh, a commercial company, Alpha Space, has launched more than 4,000 satellites in low Earth orbit around Earth to provide global high-speed internet access. Figure six shows an artist's impression of a small number of satellites in Earth's orbit. All right. The satellite, so the latest satellites placed in the orbit have a mass of 800 kilograms and, a, and an orbit at an altitude of 550 kilometers. Show that the, speed, the period of the orbit of the satellite is 5.73 um, assuming that the orbit is circular, assuming that the orbit is circular and stable. All right, so let's do that. I'm just going to kind of draw a diagram here. So what we basically have is your Earth. Nice, kind of, I mean, come on. You have the Earth here, and basically, at an altitude at 550, was it? Somewhere around here. 550 kilometers, basically you have like a satellite. So... If we want to basically calculate the periods, we're going to basically use Kepler's laws here. So, Kepler's law, um, which is... Look at my summary sheet. Where is that? So, Kepler's law. All right, here it is. So, basically, Kepler's law for period is... Um, T, your period, is equal to the square root of... 4 pi squared r uh, cubed over gm, which is basically, okay, the square root of your g value, which is your constant. So, so wait, 4 pi squared uh, r cubed. So, your rate, this is your orbital radius. So, it's not, you have to add it with the radius of the earth to get the, between them, the centers here. So, basically, it's the, um, what's the, Radius of the Earth. It's in the formula sheet. It is six point three seven times ten to the power of six plus your orbital, uh, your altitude, of course. So five hundred and fifty times ten to the power of three cubed, basically. And G is six point six seven times ten to the negative eleven. And your mass of your Earth, your central mass, is basically. 5.9. This is all in your summary sheet. I'm looking at my summary sheet right now. It's in your formula sheet, your mass and your radius of the Earth. 24. So basically putting this in my calculator, I should get 4 pi squared times 6.37 times 6 plus 5550 times 3 cubed. So 6.67 times, times 10 to the negative 11 times... 5.97 times 2.24, and I get, basically, your period is 5731.7, which is basically the same as that. I mean, yeah, that's the same thing. Wait, so show that the period of that is that. Yeah, so basically this... Why did they put the box here, then? <laughs> I think that's a mistake, because you're not supposed to put the box if you're not... um. If you're showing something, yeah, so that's the same period as that. Beautiful. So I'm just going to basically put the same thing here. So 5.73 times 10 to the power of 3 seconds. Beautiful. Uh, how many complete orbits will a satellite make in one day? Now, remember, we just calculated the period. So the period is how much does it, how long does the satellite take to do a complete orbit, basically? So in one day, how many seconds are there? So let's compare that. So... In one day, there's 24 hours, and there is, you know, 60 minutes times 60 to get in terms of seconds. 
And so that's the overall how long a day is. But basically, this is how long it takes for the satellite to do a full orbit. So putting that, dividing it by that should give us how, how many times the you know, satellite was orbiting. All right, so 5.73 times 10 to power 3. So I should get 24 times 60 times 60. Got that answer. I basically get 15. Basically 15 orbits. Beautiful. So calculate the speed of the satellite um, in orbit. All right, so we know that speed is the square root of your GMR. So basically, what's your G value? So you remember it's, it's basically 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. Your mass of your central panel, which is Earth, was 5.97 times 10 to the power of 24. Mm -hmm. And divided by your radius, your orbital radius, which was the addition of the Earth's radius, so 6.37 times 10 to the power of 6. Yep, so that's the radius of the Earth, plus your altitude, 550 kilometers. 550 times 10 to the power of 3. That looks good, yep. 550 times 10 to the power of 3, beautiful. So, that will give me... 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. 5.97 times 10 to the power of 24. Um, 6.37 times 10 to the power of 6 plus 550 times 10 to the power of 3. So that gives me basically 7 to 3 70 figures will do. So 7 point. 7.59 times 10 to the power of 3. Yep, 1, 2, 3. Yep, beautiful. C. Alpha Space already had, has approved to place 12,000 satellites in orbit and plan to eventually put a further 30,000 satellites in orbit. Alpha Space refreshes its satellite system every five years with newer technology. At the end of the service, the old satellites are steered out of the stable orbits into a descending path into the upper atmosphere um, when they burn, where they burn. Take the edge of the Earth's atmosphere to be 100 kilometers above the Earth's surface. Will the satellites be going slower at the same rate or faster as they descend towards the um, Earth's atm upper atmosphere? Justify your answer. All right, easy. So let's think about it. If we know the velocity is basically, again, the square root of GMR, yeah? So basically when your satellite, they basically put the satellite, um, they steer out the satellite descending. So it descends to the um, upper atmosphere of the Earth. So your radius basically is decreasing, basically. Your radius is actually decreasing. So if your radius decreases, what happens to your speed? It increases. Remember, if your radius is in the denominator, your velocity increases. Pretty much what that means is that if as it descends, as the um, satellite descends, its speed increases, basically. Yeah. And so let's prove it here. So I'm going to just write a nice statement here. Let's use a different color, let's use blue. So basically from V is equal to square root of GMR. That's kind of right. GMR like that. Mm -hmm. uh, as V is proportional to basically one over square root of R from the formula. So as um, R decreases, V increases, hence speed will be faster as it descends. Beautiful, so yep. As R decreases, V increases, and speed will be faster as it descends. So just a physics, um, let's have a look at this. So, so just a physics reason why all satellites burn up when they enter the Earth's atmosphere. This is not too bad. So remember that, okay. Okay, so what we have is basically when you, you remember the atmosphere is very thick. Like it's very, um, you know, it's dense. It's very dense. So basically when 
you know, they steer up the old satellites, when they steer them up towards the atmosphere, what happens? Well, we knew that, you know, your velocity increases. So they have a lot of kinetic energy, basically. And so if they have a lot of kinetic energy, because it's dense, the atmosphere, it has a lot of friction. So basically, imagine the old satellite's going down and there's so much friction. And so what that friction does, it basically, it causes it to heat. Um, remember, there's friction and there's air resistance. It causes the satellite to basically heat so much that it basically just, you know, uh, burns up, basically. So it doesn't, you know, show up in the Earth. Um, yeah, because it's only one mark. Makes sense. So remember, what it is, is that they what old satellites do is they burn up as they enter the upper atmosphere because of heat and are basically due to friction and air resistance of the up, you know, upper atmosphere. So... Yeah, and we also proved that, yeah, as they reach the um, atmosphere, their velocity de increases. So, of course, that means that there's more friction and air resistance on them. So, yeah, one mark. Let's do that. Let's write that what we said. Okay, so old, basically, uh, satellites burn up when they enter the upper um, atmosphere due to the intense heating caused by friction um, and air resistance. Yep. I'm just going to basically go more in detail just to help students. So, uh, because this, so the satellite friction heating increases as the satellite's speed increases due to due to the denser atmosphere, due to the denser atmosphere. And that goes in very much detail. So yeah, beautiful atmosphere. So here, beautiful. It's only one mark. So question six, let's have a try at this. Let's use a color. Okay, let's use this. Proton accelerators are used to investigate the effects of low energy protons beams on a simple biological cell. The path of these protons are controlled using magnetic fields in an apparatus similar to that shown um, in figure seven. An electrical field E is initially accelerates a proton between those two plates. The proton then exits into a region of uniform magnetic field B at right angle to its path, which is directed out of the page. As shown in figure seven A, the magnetic field is used to change that direction of the travel of the proton so that it can accurately hit the experiment target containing that biological cell. Beautiful. So mass of the proton, charge of the proton. Ah, there's a mistake here. Have a look here. Why is the mass times center to the power of 27? It's supposed to be a negative there. That's a little mistake they've made there. So just supposed to be a negative down there. Negative 27. It's very small. So we have the charge of proton acts right, accelerating voltage, distance, and the strength of the magnetic field. Calculate the strength of the uniform electrical field E between the two plates. Easy. So I'm just going to look at the formula to calculate the electrical field strength. So, all right. Okay. So we know voltage is equal to ED. So if we want the electrical field strength, it's E is equal to voltage over distance. So your voltage is basically 10 times 10 to the power of 3, because it's kilovolts, over the distance, which is 20 times 10 to the negative 2 to make it into uh, meters. So 10 times 3, 20 times 10 to the 2. Basically, that gives me, um, so 1, 2, 3, 4. Basically, it gives me 5.0 times 10 to the power of 4. Beautiful. Uh, determine the energy of a proton and electrovolt as it exits the electrical field. Now, that's easy because we know that kinetic energy, which is your energy, is QV. So, if I know that the charge is basically 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 of a proton, and timesing it by the voltage was 10 kilovolts, we basically get... Uh, 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19. 
10 times 2 power 3. We get basically, in terms of kinetic energy, 1.6 times 10 to the negative 15 joules. But we want it in terms of electrovolts. So basically, just don't forget to divide it by 1.6 times 10 to the negative 90 to get into electrovolts. That gives me, well, it just basically gives me, so 1.0 times 10 to the power of 4. So, yep, 1, 2, 3, 4. Beautiful. That, yeah, that's one more. Beautiful. Um, C, calculate the speed of the proton as it exits the electrical field through sure, working out. All right. So, we know that our kinetic energy, we just calculate our kinetic energy. We know kinetic energy is half mv squared. Basically meaning that 2ke over m square root is equal to your velocity. So, hence your velocity is basically just going to be the square root of, let me put this here, 2 times your kinetic energy. Um, so we want kinetic energy, of course, in joules. Be careful, we want it in joules. So um, what I'm going to basically do is, you know, in terms of joules, so it was 1.6. So I just want to double check it again. 1 times 10 to the power 3. Yeah, so 1.6, 10 to the power of negative 15 joules. Uh, divided by the mass of the proton. What is the mass of a proton? 1.7 times 10 to the negative 27. 1.7 times 10 to the 10 to the negative 7. Yep. So that gives me basically square root 2 times that. 1.7 times 10 to the negative 27. I basically get um, approximately to two significant figures. 1.4 times 10 to the power of 6. Is that correct again? 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Yes, 1.4 times 10 to the power of 6. Beautiful. Uh, D, with a different accelerating voltage, a photon now exits the electrical field at a speed of 1. Th so basically this speed. Calculate the radius of the path of this proton in the magnetic field. Beautiful. So we know that radius is equal to mv over qb. Meaning that the mass of the proton, which we was 1.7 times 10 to the negative 27, times your velocity, which is 1.0 times 10 to the power of 6, all being divided by the charge, which is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19, times your magnetic field, uh, which they gave it to us, 2.0. So. 2.0 times 10 to the negative 2. Is that right? Yep. And so that gives me 1.7 times 10 to the negative 27. 0 times 10 to the power of 6. 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19. 2.0 times 10 to the negative 2. And that gives me basically 0 0.43. So 0 0.53. Perfect. Question E. The experimental target is moved as shown in figure 7b below and with the same initial accelerating settings. So everything's the same, just we can see that the experimental target's moved. So it was originally here, they're both basically up. So just one modification to the value, to the value set for the experiment equipment that will allow the proton to hit the experimental target in this new position. I mean, there's many ways you can do this. So modification to the values of set of the experiment. Okay, let's think about it. So, what we want to do basically, what our aim wants, we want to do is basically we want to decrease our radius because remember how our radius is this here? If you decrease your radius, you'll hit the experimental target. So we want our radius to be basically decreased. So remember the radius is mvqb. So, okay, let's see ways we can actually decrease your radius. Of course, we can't change mass, we can't change Q. These are things that we just can't change, they're constant. B, yes, we can. Your magnetic field strength, we can actually try to change it so we can make our radius small. So to make our radius small, we want to increase your magnetic field. So that's one way. <clears throat> it's only one mark, so you can just say increase your magnetic field strength, basically, and that's going to basically decrease your radius. Or another thing is to manipulate that velocity because we know also this velocity here. What we want to basically do is we want to decrease velocity to make the radius small. How do we do that? Going basically back to here. Uh, okay. 
So, we know that um, half mv squared, your kinetic energy is qv, basically, which is 2qv over m square root. What that tells me is my velocity. So, if, because we want to decrease your velocity, basically. To do that, what we can also do is we can decrease your voltage. So, if we decrease the voltage, it will decrease our velocity and it will decrease, hence, our radius. So, these are the two possibilities that you can basically put and yeah. But I'm going to put the easiest one, which is the magnetic field. I'm going to put actually both of them just to write it down there so students can check. All right. So we can say increase magnetic field strength. So we want to increase the magnetic field strength. Um, also, or decrease the voltage. That is it. So increase the magnetic field strength or decrease the voltage are the combination we can do. Question seven. Let's have a try this. Figure eight shows a small DC electrical motor powered by a battery that is connected through a split ring commutator. The rectangular coil has sides KJ, LM. The magnetic field between the poles of the magnet is uniform and constant. All right, so it looks perfect. Nothing's different, yep. The switch is now closed and the rectangular coil Rotates explain the function of a split ring commutator. One of the most repeated questions. I've always told my students, write this definition in your summary sheet. It's, I think in every exam, there's a question like this. It's so easy to get full marks for it. So I'm basically, I'm just going to look at my, um, my formula sheet and basically just copy the definition of it. It's so easy to get full marks for this question. Um, so what it does basically... Right. If you don't have this, please make sure you write it down in your summary sheet. It comes up in every exam, and it's the easiest marks you can get. So basically, it acts to reverse the direction of current within the coil. Uh, every half rotation at the vertical position. This reverses the direction of the force on each side of the coil so that the direction of rotation is constant. Beautiful. Done. Easy as two marks you can get or three marks sometimes in exams. Let's have a look at the next question B. On the axis below, sketch the force on the side JK on the rectangular coil, so the force on JK versus time, for one complete revolutions of a DC motor. Uh, take directly up as the being positive and take T equals zero from the position of the coil shown in question eight. All right. So basically JK, let's have it. So we're taking up as positive. How would that graph look like for one complete revolution? So JK, so, if I'm, so basically the current's going this way. And using my right hand slap rule, the force is up basically on that. So the force on JK is basically the our force is up. Okay. So our force is basically up. Now let's really have a think about this. All right. Now we know that the force is always constant. Remember that this force is always constant. It's always there. So if I'm drawing like a basically a force time graph, imagine having a look looking at through this side. So imagine this is your LM, looking at the loop in this side. So imagine this is your LM. Okay. And so this is your J, basically, and this is your M. So basically, we can see that the force is up on J to K. So this force here, that's your up. So that's good. So it starts at the positive and it's constant. And so even as the loop basically starts to move, to rotate a little bit. So let me just... Do that. The force is still up. So it's still, this is your J and this is your K, J and this is your M. Your force is still up. 
your force is still up and it's always constant until it hits the vertical position. Basically, when you hit the vertical position, we know that when you hit the vertical position, what happens if you hit the vertical position? So that's um, your, and J and this is your M basically at that position. What happens? Well, when you're hitting that vertical position, your, your splits in your split ring commutator will be like this basically. And so there will be no electrical contact between the external circuit and the coil. So there's no current. And so guess what? There, basically when it hits that vertical position, there is no force. So let's think about this here. So basically for basically nearly um, a quarter of the turn, so basically a quarter of a turn, the force is constant and it's positive because it's always up. You see, it's like this, it's up. All right, like that. And so when it reaches the vertical position, we know that the force becomes zero. And so what happens is disconnect basically. So you can get this. And so then what happens is this. Um, because, so when it disconnects, basically the torque is still there and basically it still pushes it a little bit more to the right. And then guess what? Then this happens. Your current, so your direction of your force changes because of the split ring commutator. So basically, um, now this is your J and, and basically this is your M basically. And now the force on J and K are basically down. Now it's downwards. And so basically it will be downwards um, until it basically, so it will be downwards. So we went through here. So basically it will be downwards full rot So basically, what am I saying? Wait, so it will be, um, so it will be downwards. So if it's this, this is the vertical position basically. Um, so when it's kind of rotated like this, it'll be downwards. It'll be downwards basically until, so it'll be downwards when basically it's, wait, what's wrong with this? This is a little bit, okay, I don't want to confuse myself. So we know it's, so it's now downwards and it'll be downwards till, till, oh my God, till like, um, it hits the, um, it becomes, you know, down here. So before it moves this way, basically. So it'll be down basically for the rest of the two, there we go. So better that's the quarter of a turn. Then this is the, um, when it's basically now, you know, rotate a little bit here. And so as it a little bit more rotates, rotates, when it hits again, the vertical position, when it hits that vertical position, then it will come back to an upwards force up, basically. Its force will become up again. And go to the right. It will have a positive one. And so that's how the graph would look like. I hope that makes sense. I think that is correct, if I'm not mistaken. It looks, yeah, makes sense. Because the force is constant. Remember, the forces are constant. It's just, yeah, the split ring commutator. Yep, so if it was, all right. So then, yeah, yeah. So now, all right. Yep, J. And so even if it's in this vertical position, it's still down. Even if it's in, like, you know, this position and gets closer. Um, when it basically reaches that, huh, so that is good, yep, that, basically when it's in this position also, on J, it's also down until it basically becomes, par um, when the split's again parallel, and then when it goes up again like this, then it goes up again, yep. It's a little bit, ugh, it's a, for two marks, is it two marks? Well, how many marks? Sorry, what, what am I doing? Okay, for three marks, wow. Yeah, um, that looks right, but it's just, ooh, that's a, it's a lot of thinking. It's not a lot of thinking, it's just, don't, you don't want to kind of confuse yourself, I think. That's the key thing here. Don't want to confuse yourself too much. Yeah, it makes absolute sense. I hope that makes sense. Um, yeah, perfect. Looks good. It's very hard to explain, wow. Because it, 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 like, it's hard to kind of, in this 3D model, it's, it's, yeah, you really can't explain it that real. All right, perfect. That looks perfect. Um, question eight, let's have a try at this one. Uh, figure nine shows a simple AC generator consists of a rectangular coil of 500 turns that rotates in a uniform magnetic field. The output voltage can be displayed on an oscilloscope. The magnetic flux for the coil at the position shown in figure nine is this, and the magnetic field is that, calculate the area. Beautiful. So we know that magnetic flux is your area times your magnetic field. So if you want the area, it's your magnetic flux over your magnetic field, which, what's your flux we just got it 2.0 2 
times 10 to the power of um, negative 3. And so your magnetic field strength is 0 0.8. So that will give me 2.0 times 7 negative 3, 0 0.8. Basically, that will give me to two significance, so 2.5 times 10 to the power of negative 3. Yep, 1, 2, 3. Beautiful. Question B. The generator starts rotating from rest and speed of rotation gradually increased until it's rotating at a constant rate after two cycles have elapsed. Throughout its motion, it produces an AC output. On the axis below, sketch the EMF output versus time graph for the coil. Beginning when the coil's at rest, when it produces a constant AC output, show at least three cycles of the coil's rotation values on the axis axes are not required wow this here is a very very hard question not because it's just it's not hard it just takes a lot of thinking critical thinking here for two marks is not a lot i think it should be like four marks it's just yeah so let's kind of think about this all right so basically what's happening is basically it starts from rest let's think about it so i'm going to draw the easiest phase the easiest way to draw emf graph is first to draw that magnetic flux diagram of it so basically let's try to draw one What's happening is basically this. Well, initially what's happening is... All right, let's think about this. So we can see that the coil, like when it starts, it basically has magnetic maximum magnetic flux because those field lines are passing through it. But because it starts at rest, it's basically slowly rotating. It starts slowly rotating from rest. So it means your, your, um, your period is very long. So it'll basically look like this. You'll have this very long period. And so as it gradually gets more speed, so as it gradually gets more speed, so as it gradually gets more speed, its period starts to decrease. You can see that those periods are starting to decrease. So that's one right. I mean, a little bit much more. Oops. So like that, like this, like this, and like that. So... That's one rotation, that's two rotations. And so it basically then, because it said two rotations, basically it has two rotations um, where then it produces a constant. So it starts from rate, it's gradually increased. So two cycles have elapsed. So when two elapse ha after, it has a constant rate basically then. All right, perfect. So basically then after those two, it'll be like a constant nice graph like this. So oops, so let me just kind of... So after that, all these are going to look the same, basically. these Like that. It's basically all going to look the same. So it basically starts with a high period and starts to decrease at a constant rate of the period. Beautiful. So that's a basically change in flux diagram over time. Now, now to draw EMF. Ah, this is a little bit more harder. So what's going to happen with our EMF? It's a little bit different because we know that EMF is... Your change in flux over change in time, where you bet, of course, you have n, but we don't worry about n here. So, you so we can easily use our change in flux diagram, but there's also a big problem the time it starts slow, so your time is very high, meaning that your basically amplitude of your EMF graph is going to be very low. And so, as it gradually speeds up, its amplitude is going to start to you know go higher and higher and higher until it reaches a constant value. So, that's what we don't want to forget, too. So Let's have a draw at the diagram, basically. I want to just draw now, having this to help me out. I can easily use this to my advantage. Oh my god, I just basically need to move this a little bit more. Come on. There it is. Okay, so I want to leave it right over here. Okay, so what's going to happen basically is so this here, if you don't know basically methods, this is, looks like a, this is a cosine graph basically, close to a cosine graph. And so when you basically derive it and you know times it by a negative number, because you remember your EMF is negative n, your gradient, um, change in theta over change in time. So this is your gradient. So that so and then you multiply by negative. So basically, it's going to have be sine. It's basically going to be a sine x graph. So basically, it's going to start. At zero and but this is for methods. It makes it easier if you know methods. But I'm going to explain how you would do it in basically normal. Um, basically, okay. You remember any stationary point, any of these of these points here, stationary points we call them, are going to have a EMF of zero, of course. So basically, if I'm looking at this graph, 
I know this part here is going to have the EMF of zero. I want to draw in a nice kind of color. So that's EMF zero. EMF here is going to be like zero. Um, EMF is going to be, I'm starting to like a little bit decrease them so he kind of visually sees them. EMF gets a little bit much more smaller at zero. And yeah, and I think, so yep, so one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, and then it becomes basically constant. All right, so first let's just have a try at drawing this first. So basically, we can see that the gradient from here to here is basically going down. So it's going to be negative. So but if it's negative, we have to times it by another negative to make a positive because remember your EMF has this negative in there. So it's going to be having a positive gradient. So it's basically going to be increasing. So it's going to be increasing to that stationary point basically. So it's going to look like... But it's going to have a low amplitude because remember it, it has a high period so basically it's going to have like a nice low amplitude like this very low amplitude basically like a nice low amplitude so it has a high period and so as it gradually you know the period gets smaller it's um amplitude gets bigger of course so you got that then of course you get more of a um what do we call so you get a little bit more of a bigger one a little bit Come on. Okay, this is going to take me years to get. Why do I just struggle to make some little basic graphs? Why is it struggling? Come on. Mm, all right, I don't know what's happening, but if I just, because I just want to make sure. There it is. Okay. So if I put that there, put that there, I'm playing around with this. I want this to be a little bit higher amplitude, like that. That looks quite nice. And then. Add another one here. There it is. Right there. And so basically this here is going to be a little bit much of a higher amplitude than the original, the first one. So like that, with a lower period. Beautiful. And so then, um, that, and then I think just like a little bit on here. So wait, that's one cycle. Okay, you need another cycle. So basically like, um, it's going to be a little bit much more here. It's going to look like this, but this one's bigger, basically. <laughs> Come on. There it is. Basically, that's going to be here. Basically here. And it would look like this, much of a larger. And yeah, so it's getting larger and larger. And then it basically... So these are two cycles. And then we said after that, it basically becomes a constant um, then. So basically constant. So basically, it's just going to be... Constantly these graphs here. In the same period basically. So I'm gonna what I'm gonna do is basically I'm gonna Okay, this is gonna take so long. Why does it really Okay there it is? I'm gonna take this, take that, take this with the same amplitude like that. And that looks quite nice. I mean what I'm gonna do basically is just now copy this graph here, duplicate it, put it there, duplicate it again. Put it there. Come on. There it is, like that. Duplicate there. So this is more than a lot of cycle, but it should look like this. So it's going to start with an amplitude that's going to be starting small, and then as it increases, it's going to have a larger amplitude. Uh, basically, yeah. That makes absolutely sense. Beautiful. Yep, that makes... Yeah, that looks... Right, am I in any mistake? I mean, it's such a hard question for two marks, really. It is such a really, really hard question to put for two marks. I hope that makes sense. Does that look right? I'm just trying to see if, if I made any mistakes, seeing if I can... Um, so if it started at max and then started... Yeah, it looks good. Yeah, okay, so it looks good. I think it's no problem, but yeah, that looks perfect. All right. Yeah, so now question C. The general recall is now rotated at a constant frequency. The maximum magnetic flux is still this. The average EMF introduced over a quarter of a cycle is starting from the position of the maximum magnetic flux and is 40 volts. Beautiful. Calculate the frequency of rotation of the generator. Beautiful. So for a quarter turn, it goes from magnetic, um, you know, max flux to zero flux, which is a, we will have a change in flux. So we will, so we know that EMF, write it down. EMF is basically N times change in flux. 
of a change in time. So we need our change in time to calculate our frequency. So EMF is 40. N is... Do we have N? N? From our old one? 500 turns. Okay. 500 turns. Your change in flux is basically still 2.0 times 10 to the power of negative 3. All being divided by your change in time. So basically, that's going to give me... It gives me 0 0.025 seconds. Now, think about it. This is not... Remember, we want our period. We need the period. The period is how long does it complete a full revolution. This is only a quarter of a turn. So you need to multiply by 4. Zero point one. So basically, this is our period. So, hence our frequency is just one over our period, which is basically one over zero point one, which means that it's one over that, which gives me ten hertz of frequency. Beautiful. Last question. Let's have a look at this question. Explain the role of the slip slip ring commutator in AC general. What a beautiful question to end this at, uh, in this basically exam. Uh, to end the first part, of course, but um. Again, make sure you have this in your formula sheet. It is so important to have these in your formula sheet because they always repeat in every exam. Um, it's very easy. Slip, basically, a slip ring, what it does is basically it allows the coil basically to rotate while also maintaining contact with an external circuit. That's what it does. And basically what it does, the use of it is basically it alternates the EMFs, basically producing AC uh, electricity, not, yeah, DC. So, I mean, just copy the definition from your, I would say, your... Um, your formula sheet, it's very, yeah, it's such an easy basic question. Explain the rule. So let's do that. Okay. Slip ring. Allow the coil in an alternator to rotate while maintaining contact with an external circuit this results in the alternating EMF induced in the coil Producing AC current, producing AC electricity. Beautiful. And that is it. I think that goes in deep detail. And yeah, I hope these solutions are all correct. Please make sure to like and subscribe for more future videos. If you see any mistake or you have concerns of anything that is confusing, please make sure to comment it down below. I should, if I have time, I'll, you know, try to reply. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Please make sure to like and subscribe and please take care of yourself. So bye-bye.